up. Looks like it's warming up. Okay, we are on air. Hide the women and the children. Hank Strange and Mike Daddy. We're in the building live from the Big Daddy Gun Studios in beautiful, sunny Gainesville, Florida. That's where I'm at. Mike is in Arizona. How's it going, Mike? It's going good. Nice and sunny here, too. Awesome. Awesome. So welcome, everyone, back to the show. Mike Deddy is gun guy, gun author. Here's his book right here. So, you know, I'll show this a couple of times. Operation Wide Receiver, also uh, known as Guns Across the Border. Right, Mike? Right. That's the, the original hardback is Guns Across the Border. Absolutely. Okay. And we're going to talk about this. You want to tell us just real briefly what the book is about. We'll come back and get real in depth into it a little later. Sure. The book is, is uh, about my experience working with ATF for three years, selling guns to cartel members. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's it. In a nutshell. <laughs> that's some, that's some real, that's the real deal right there. Yeah. Yeah. Out of your house, right? <laughs> Out of, out of, right where I'm sitting right now, that right out of the living room. Yeah, like genuine, authentic, not movie cartel dudes, the real cartel dudes, right? Real, real life stuff, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to talk about that, what happened with that whole story, and we're going to talk about a bunch of other things with Mike. I'm going to give you guys a chance to, um, you know, hit us up with your questions. I want to remind you all, if you know, watching this, share this broadcast with your friends out there on your social media. Let them know. That we're doing this don't forget to like and comment and all that kind of good stuff that helps build up everything that we're doing here um and before we get into this i should talk about i guess i should talk a little bit about the whole sig p320 debacle mike have you heard about this i have heard about it and i've been following it mostly on facebook it's uh, interesting to say the least yeah so, you know, I mean, you've been around in guns a lot longer than I have. I'm not trying to say you're an old dude. <laughs> you can <laughs> say that. Because, you know, you're my buddy and I love you. <laughs> I'm seasoned. <laughs> yeah, seasoned. That's a good one. <laughs> like, you know, you've been around for a long time. I mean, the, uh, the onset of the Internet has totally changed the game, right? Absolutely. It's uh, almost instantaneous nowadays. Yeah, it's it's like there's no way to hide for companies. And we've been talking about this since last week. I know that originally I think there was a um, – obviously, SIG won the contract with the Army, right, and a few other places. And um, that's always a good thing. Some people aren't ha weren't happy about it. You know, some people were very happy about it and went out there and bought a bunch of uh, P320s. And then um, things started coming up that, um, like, I think there was the Dallas Police Department had concerns about it not being drop safe. Right, right. That's it. My understanding is uh, that that somebody actually read the manual and it said, "Hey, this gun might go off if it's dropped," and uh, they put a hold on things until they could get further clarification. Not that it had happened, or that somebody had been injured, but. Um, uh, based strictly on something that's mentioned in the manual. Yeah. And so then what happened after that is I think that um, there were a lot of different conflicting things going on and people were pulling back and saying, no, it is drop safe. It was tested and all that kind of stuff. We did, we did a show about this um, on, I think it was on Friday. We did a show. We had military arms channel on who he's done some uh, testing of the 320. We also had Patrick R. from the Firearm blog who's written some articles about it. Have you gotten Because you are a gun writer. You write for magazines and, and several different places, right? That's right. Uh -huh. So have yeah. you gotten a chance to test the P320? I've never fired one. Oh, okay. So, you know, we, we, did, we talked about it a little bit, and we were talking about all the different things going on, and we got a lot of hate from uh, P320 fanboys. Sure. You know, and, you know, I had the P250s. Do you remember those? I do. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, that was like, to me, my first introduction to the whole modular thing that you could take out this frame or chassis and move it around. Really wasn't very good. It had a really long trigger pull. I think the, the uh, 320 is a lot better. So I wasn't really trying to come down on it. Just, you know, hey, this is out there. But since the, the one thing about the Internet is when things come out, people start testing. You know, so several several places, I think Omaha Outdoors was the first one that actually did drop testing. 
and they found it was going off. And now um, I think the Firearm blog and a few other places have done that and getting the same results. Definitely, you know, I should tell you guys not to go out there and drop test your guns. That's not a good idea. <laughs> no. I don't know. Have you ever done any drop testing? No, I, I've never never had occasion to. You know, as a as a writer, more of a reporter, it's kind of up to me to uh, to have other people do that stuff and and report on it. But uh, I've never had occasion to uh, take a nice gun and drop it on concrete because uh, usually they get upset with me if I send yeah. it. Because <laughs> those things have to go back. Up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, you know. Basically, that's come out, and then today, uh, breaking in the last few hours, SIG has actually announced, I'm going to pull this up just so I make sure I get it right here. Um, so this is on the truth about guns. This is from Dan Zimmerman. It says, in a response to a variety of reports, SIG Sawyer P320 pistols discharging when dropped, the company announced today that it developed a number of enhancements in function, reliability, and overall safety, including drop performance. SIG is offering these upgrades to all P320 owners. So it's kind of like a voluntary, they're not calling it a recall. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a voluntary thing that if you have concerns, you can uh, you can send your P320 back to them and it looks like they'll upgrade the trigger. Does, does, um, does drop safe matter to you? Well, uh, yeah, absolutely it does. Uh, I mean, we just had an incident last week where uh, a supposed federal agent dropped his gun and um, I guess he was shot trying to catch it. But uh, any time that a product has the ability to fire when it's dropped muzzle down or even hammer down, not a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I mean, I think I've heard that in the past there's been lots of issues with 1911s. I think there's nowadays there's some 1911s that are drop safe, but they traditionally were not right. That's correct. Yeah. 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 But more, but more modern guns are, or should be. You know, most of the uh, the striker fired guns that I, I've seen and examined in in, de in detail have um, uh, something that prevents the striker from moving forward unless the trigger is purposely pulled. And uh, of course, that's a good thing. That's what you want. Uh, you know, some type of mechanical block that actually keeps that striker from contacting the firing pin unless right. you have pressure on the trigger. Yeah. And and then I think there was another incident, if I'm not mistaken, there was a, a police officer that dropped the gun inside of a holster. Uh, I'm not sure where that article is, but I know I saw something like that earlier today and he wound up shooting himself in the leg and I think he's got a lawsuit in progress. I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. Surprise, surprise. So, um, yeah. This this is gonna um, this is gonna keep developing. I think it's probably a good thing though that they are offering at least to folks out there that are concerned an upgrade. Well, they did it quickly, and uh, I think that shows the consumer that um, they're listening and uh, they're they're reacting to whatever they need to. And of course, they you know they still have that army contract. They're ahead of them and. Uh, I think they would rather get that out of the way now than have to recall some military guns at some point in the future. Yeah, it looks like from what I've read that they uh, kind of knew about this going in and the military ones, the military versions don't have this problem. So they did something with those. The question is, why did they um, let so many civilian ones go out there with that problem? But, uh, you know, who knows? Yeah, I, I wish I could give you some information. I'm just not privy to any of it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, over the years, what's your experience been with SIG? Are you a fan, not a fan, tested? You know, uh, over the years, I haven't done a tremendous amount of uh, SIG evaluations, probably four or five guns, and have another one actually on the way to me right now, uh, an MPX uh, pistol. But uh, the, the people there at the company are, are great to deal with. Um, they've always helped me out whenever I've needed help or needed something. And the products that I've had from them have always been extremely accurate. I've never had to send one back because it didn't work right the, you know, the first go around. Mm -hmm. So uh, all, my, all my experience with SIG has been very positive. Yeah. 
Okay. And then, like you said, you know, it's definitely a good thing that they're addressing it, getting out there in front of it. And, um, you know, if people want to do something about this, there's definitely a way to do it. So I would suggest looking up, uh, you know, just doing a, a Google search, you'll come up with this stuff and you'll get details on how to uh, send your P320 back if you're concerned about it. Well, yeah. I'm sure they've, they've posted something already on their their homepage regarding yeah. that so yeah absolutely so yeah yeah go check out uh, sig sig sour us or whatever their dot com is and uh, do that and then and then while you're at it I did put a link in this to Mike's book you guys can go check that out <laughs> you know it's a pretty good book Mike you want to tell us uh, like give us a little bio for folks who don't know about you you know who you are and then how you wound up in the situation that you had to write this book. Sure, uh, my name is Mike Deddy, and for probably 27 years now, I've been writing for gun magazines. But at one point in time, I had a change in, in careers, and uh, I went from the medical field into the firearm sales field, and I had a company that sold uh, AR-15s, DPMS, and Rock River uh, at Arizona gun shows, and it was during that endeavor. I ran into somebody who made a solicitation to do something illegal and uh, I, I took that information to ATF and dropped it in their lap and instead of just letting them roll with it, they actually asked me if I would be part of the investigation and help them and really without putting too much thought into it or realizing how deep it would go. Um, I made a commitment to them. Uh, what was supposed to be a three week investigation ended up being three years. And during that time period, I sold at least five different families or cartels um, guns from the living room of my, of my home. Uh, it was, uh, it was quite a bit, quite an adventure. Uh, it didn't have a happy ending, still doesn't have a happy ending. Uh, because one of our border patrol agents was killed with uh, not an operation wide receiver gun, but a fast and furious gun. But it's all all the same thing, all the same people, the same tactics. Uh, it never really was an investigation. Basically, what it was was a uh, a mechanism to put as many American guns into Mexico as possible, and uh, I believe it was with the intent of. Uh, uh, having guns show up at Mexican crime scenes so that they could push for more gun regulation here in the United States. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, this was under several administrations, right? Started with me in the Bush administration in uh, 2006 and went well into the Obama administration. Yeah. So. My, my participa participation was from 2006 through 2010. Okay. And um, like how many guns do you think these guys let go across the border? There were yeah. thousands. I mean, just in Operation Wide Receiver, there were about 800 guns that came directly from me to the cartels under, of course, under the direction and orders of ATF. Um, Operation Fast and Furious was at least 3,000, but probably a lot more than that. Um, wow, through you. Not, not no, through no, you. No, no, that was through that was through other people. Fast and Furious, yeah, there were a couple gun shops yeah. in the Phoenix area that were involved in that. Um, so between the two operations, literally thousands, probably tens of thousands of guns that ATF was aware of and allowed to cross the border without interdicting them or stopping them. Yeah. So, I mean, I've got several questions about this. Uh, one, do you think this is anything like this is still going on? It's hard for me to say, you know, the uh, um, when Fast and Furious was discovered or made public because uh, Border Patrol agent Brian Terry was killed, uh, a lot of scrutiny and a lot of heat was put on ATF. And I don't, you know, like cockroaches, they don't like to be out in the sunlight. So I would imagine they're doing everything to stay low profile. Um, it would just be senseless for them to be doing it right now, um, as, especially under our, our, our new leadership with Mr. Trump. But um, I mean, it's anything's possible. I mean, mine started under President Bush and they were able to 
to really stay under the radar a long time about that. Yeah. And uh, just, you know, if anyone out there has any misconceptions, you're you're 100 percent not happy with what went down. Right. The end result, I mean, uh, you know, when my first day when they had me up in their office and they asked me to help them, this was about taking down a drug cartel. This was not about instituting new gun regulations here in the United States. And even at that time, I would I would imagine the assistant uh, special agent in charge that was handling this case was un unaware of what it really was. I think that the true intent at the beginning was to uh, to be able to take down a drug cartel. But as years went by and more and more guns went across the border and nothing was done to to stop that flow. Um, uh, there was a, a big change in the attitude of the agents I worked with. And I, I think at that point they realized what was going on, but just weren't able to tell me because that would have ended my involvement. And as far as they were concerned, I was the conduit to these, to these bad guys. Yeah. And, um, you know, I got a question from uh, 803 salad shooter. He wants to know how were the guns supposed to be tracked? Were there tracking devices? No, that and that's one of the uh, um, the the fallacies when you know when when people talk about the two operations, they, they say, well, you know, when Bush was doing it, they were putting tracking devices in the guns. It just wasn't true, and that rumor got started because at one point we did have a tracking device that they were trying to put into the buttstock of a uh, a Yugo AK-47, and. Uh, I had talked to one of my military friends and he says, you know, we've tried this, Mike. He says, but when you wrap the antenna around that unit, it burns out the battery because it's trying to read signal and it, it gets all screwy. He mm -hmm. says that the batteries wear out in, in a couple minutes instead of days. And that's exactly what, what they found out here at the local ATF office. And uh, so there were no tracking devices. What I was told was that, that they were working with the Mexican federales and that the, the federales would follow the guns on the other side of the border. And um, we found that out to not be true after the Office of Inspector General did their investigation in their report. They, I mean, there was basically zero communication with the Mexicans. Yeah. In other words, ATF was running this operation and sending guns across the border without the knowledge of the Mexicans. Yeah. And and just to like give people a, a little bit of, um, you know, a little bit of an idea of what's going on here, because I did come down. We're kind of like trying to do a documentary on what's going on with you. Um, you've been featured, I think, on uh, what was it? BBC, I think. Um, uh, BBC made a documentary that was called The Secrets of Mexico's Drug Wars. And sometimes you can find it on YouTube, although um, because BBC is owned by the by the British government, they pull it down whenever it's put up somewhere unauthorized. They they played it quite a bit on CNN last year, and uh, so it's out there. I mean, if you look hard enough, you can find it. it's called the Secrets of Mexico's Drug Wars. Right, and I think uh, was it Cheryl Atkinson or Atkinson? Cheryl Atkinson is the one yeah. from CBS News who broke um, the whole gun walking thing. Uh, she didn't break fast and furious, but she was the first to to really look in detail into why ATF was allowing guns to go across the border without stopping them. Right. So, and, and to make things clear is this was something that ATF facilitated and allowed to happen. So here you have a federal uh, law enforcement agency who, instead of enforcing the law, is actually encouraging it and facilitating it to happen. And that's the reason so many guns were allowed to get across the border without uh, somebody like ICE um, um, or uh, Customs actually stopping uh, vehicles that they knew had a bunch of guns in them. Yeah, they were just letting it go. And um, I mean, if you think about this, just for perspective, I think, you are very close to the border where you're at in Arizona, right? We're, we're just an hour's drive. Yeah. So literally some guys, and you were doing this, uh, not all of it, but some of it was going on through your house, right? Right. The majority of it, what, what would happen is I would meet these guys at gun shows, and then I would say something like, look, 
you know, there's a, there's a lot of law enforcement here at the show. So the next time you need more guns, just come out to my house and, and uh, we won't have to worry about that. And the majority of the time that happened. Yeah. And, and so you did that because it would be easier to record them and, and get the info that these agents wanted from your house versus doing it at a show, right? Absolutely, because there's just too much uh, too much going on at gun shows. The recorders um, were picking up too much background noise. There were other people around, and, and are they involved? Or are they not involved? It was uh, too hard to really sort everything out. But the ones that came out to my house, you know, it's like you had the players right there. There wasn't uh, anything else to distract them. We were getting good quality from the recordings, both from my my digital recorder and from the uh, uh, unit ATF views. So it, it just made things easier for them. Yeah. So what kind of security was provided to you? Because like every I've I've um, I've read the book. This is scary, man. <laughs> to think like you are, these people are actually come into your house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so what kind of security for folks out there that don't know? I'm sure they're curious. What kind of security did the ATF or any of these agents provide for you? Zero. Okay. Zero. So you were I mean, responsible there, there for was, your own safety. Yeah, there was. Uh, uh, I think there was only one purchase where we had another agent in the house with me, but the majority of the time, the, the case agent sat in his car, um, which is about 80 yards from my front door. And he listened to our conversation through a transmitter that was so old and so screwed up that it, most of the time it overheated and turned itself off. So then he'd pick up his cell phone and he'd call me on my cell phone and I'd be in the middle of a conversation with these bad guys and he'd say, hey, Mike, the wire's down, turn it off and then turn it back on again. <laughs> and I'm looking around to see if any of the guys had heard Yeah, were it. they deaf? <laughs> through my phone, you know, because I'm an old shooter. I've got bad hearing and I've got the volume turned up all the way. And, you know, just uh, crazy stuff like that. One night we were uh, all standing in my living room looking at some guns. And for whatever reason, some agent decided he needed to go get the license plate number. So he walked up to the car and hit it with his Surefire flashlight uh, within view from my, my picture window. And at the same time, my motion detector floodlight in front of the house went on. Um, there were a lot of screw ups like that that showed me, you know, after three years that they really didn't give a crap about my personal safety. I was just uh, somebody that was kind of aiding them and abetting them and what they were trying to do. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird thing because usually these guys are dealing with criminals, people they have some kind of leverage over, but you're a good guy, right? You you never did anything criminal. You were right. following the law by reporting this to them. Right, right. I, I took that information to them and it wasn't because I had a, a prison sentence looming over my head or anything like that. I did it because I thought it was what I needed to do to be a good citizen. And when I, when I gave that information to him, it wasn't uh, with with the idea is hey maybe they'll give me a reward or something. It was like I'm gonna I'm gonna drop this information in their lap and they can do what they need to do. And instead, I, I was presented presented with an opportunity, and they said, look, we'd like you to keep selling this guy guns, mm -hmm. and what we'd like to do is have you record them, and we'd like to surveil them and follow them and stuff. But we really need you to keep doing what you're doing and uh, cause they seem to like you and they don't suspect you at all. And uh, it kind of mushroomed from there and, it, and you'd have to read the book to understand how things progressed. But we went from, from just a couple kids buying AR 15 lowers to some real life cartel guys that were buying 25 AKs at a time from me and, 50 38 supers one one evening and uh uh you know there were times where we had fifty thousand dollars cash on my my dining room table and um you had to get like a cash counting machine almost like out of uh you know scarface or something right? yeah it's uh i actually bought a bank quality uh counting machine because most of these evenings the first half of, the, of maybe a four hour 
meeting would be just sorting and counting their cash because what they what one of the guys was doing is he was stopping by a, a stash house and his uncle or his cousin would give him a bag of money and he said just buy as many guns as you can with this money but they didn't know how much money was in the garbage bag so he'd get here and he'd dump the bag out on my dining room table and then we'd sort the hundreds and the fives and the twenties and then count it up to see how much he had yeah wow so um and and i think from uh, my recollection of the book um they got over on you at least once or twice right in terms yeah, of that was a, they shortchanged you with the money that was a, a new guy that was brought into a mix and uh what happened was the the main player that i was dealing with in my book i call him pedro he had a cousin that lived here in tucson and uh, her husband was doing federal time on a drug charge, I think in Leavenworth. But she would have barbecues every Sunday night and all sorts of type of people would come to these barbecues. And I don't mean not people from church. Mm -hmm. um, right. And she would, she would tell them, she'd say, hey, do you guys need guns? Because I've got a hookup. Here's the deal. You give me $100 for every gun you buy and I'll set you up with this guy. So a lot of evenings, there would be somebody brand new that I had never met before. And uh, that's how I got involved with the one guy that, that, uh, that burned me for about $5,000. He was the one that brought the, uh, the bodyguard with him one evening who thought he would stand behind me and intimidate me. Um, big guy too, and he did intimidate me, but I told him to go sit his ass down on the couch and he didn't like that very much either, but it was, it was probably as close as I've come to, to shooting somebody at my house. I mean, what, you know, I mean, these are people who, who rob and kill people, right? For money right. and right. guns and things like that. And you had those things. And, and for the most part, you were there. I'm sure in this situation, you were there totally by yourself. That's an easy thing yeah. to happen, man. Easy thing to go down, right? Well, you know, it's, and it's something the ATF agents told me too. They're like, look, you've got, $50,000 worth of guns sitting out in your living room and they're telling you that they're bringing you $50,000. So they might just decide to keep their money and take your guns. Mm -hmm. And um, that was always the, the cautionary word. And, you know, it, you always had to be careful in talking to them that, that I appeared to be relaxed and, and having, you know, uh, a pleasant conversation while at the same time moving and making sure that nobody was ever able to maneuver behind me or got back to me because even though I was bigger than most of these guys, there were usually four of them and one of me and it would have been an easy matter for somebody to grab me by the back of the collar and pull me down. And yeah. that would have been it for me. And it, it, the, the guy sitting out in the car from the front door would have taken him minutes to realize something, something was wrong and, and get in here. So, um, yeah, it was a, I was put in a crazy situation and, and, uh, the one night I was getting ready for one of these buys and the agent was here setting up a, a camera and, uh, I had my 45 on the table on the dining room table and I went to put it on and he said uh, something to the effect that I'm glad to see you're taking care of yourself. He says, look, if something happens, it's going to take us minutes to get to you. So you fight for your life and you do what you need to do. He said, just keep in mind, uh, the shooting's gonna be over before we before we get to you. We just don't wanna see your muzzle when we come into your house. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you know. And I mean, I understand that. If something actually went down and you went into panic mode and someone comes through that door, they're gonna get a face full of lead. Sure, but they, I mean, but basically what he was telling us is, yeah, you, you know, do what you need to do because you're on your own. It's, it's yeah. going to take us a while to get yeah. to you. And by, by the time we get to you, it's going to be over with. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, what? so I'm sure there's people who are listening to this like, OK, so how do we know these guys that you were sitting there with were really bad guys? Can you just tell us uh, a few of the things? Because I know I read the book and I really encourage everyone to go read this book. It's going to blow your mind that this happened in America not too long ago. And for all we know, can happen again, could be happening now. Like what kind of uh, evidence did you get of the stuff that, you know, the cartels and all the stuff that these guys were involved in and crimes and stuff? Because these, these were criminals, right? I'm sure the ATF oh, yeah. was, was looking at their jackets. 
Oh, absolutely. And the, the thing is, they, they identified them um, pretty rapidly. For instance, the, uh, the, the one guy that brought the bodyguard, um, the, the guy he's protecting, he was a little guy. He's about the size of a jockey. I mean, literally, I could have picked him up and thrown him across the room. But his bodyguard was about six foot four and about 260 pounds, well built and probably 15, 20 years younger than me at that time. And uh, um, anyway, uh, this person, not more than a year later, was uh, shot dead in Hermosillo. And the bodyguard? No. The guy? The, the guy, the, the guy that brought the money. Now, uh, while they were at my house, they were buying 38 supers and he was having a conversation with his bodyguard in Spanish and the bodyguard said, I don't, I don't like the 38 super. I prefer the 10 millimeter, which in Mexico is, is not a very common cartridge. The 38 super is what most of the people have. Most yeah. Of the, yeah. Most, most of the thugs. And wouldn't you know that a year later that this guy was killed with a 10 millimeter. Wow. So yeah, that's kind of like a Sopranos type deal there, right? Yeah. It yeah, possibly yeah. went down. That guy he, took out that took out his boss. Yeah, that's you know, that's supposition on my part, yeah. but I think it all adds up that way. This person, the, the person he was protecting, had a reputation for ripping off not just other dealers, but people he was working for. In other words, he'd get the drugs or he'd get the money and then when you know, wouldn't cough up the product. At one point, when they had wiretaps on his phone, he had taken deposits from people in his brother's cartel for guns and then used that money for something else. I mean, they were they were starting to threaten him. Hey, you know, we gave you that money. Now give us our guns. And um, he had to go and find a source to get more money to replace the money he had taken or spent somewhere else. So it was a big mess. And so it was... Uh, the agents I was working with, it really wasn't a surprise when he was found dead in Hermosillo. Yeah. It's just so, the way the guy operated. Right. So I've got this question from Joe Carpenter. He says, how did the bad guys not see through this setup? Um, because it seems like these guys wound up being pretty relaxed over at your house, right? Yeah. And uh, um, to, answer, to answer his question, I don't know. I mean, here I was at the time, I was. this was 10 years ago, you know, um, I still had a military haircut at the time. And um, God, if, if, those, if any of those guys had Googled my name at that point in time. Because <laughs> you, were, you were a known mag, like gun magazine writer, right? Yeah, and, I, and my, I wrote for titles like Police and Special yeah. Weapons and SWAT. And they would have found pictures of me with a, a group of officers at some training event or something. Apparently, nobody, <laughs> nobody thought to Google my name uh, uh, because they they came out here. They seemed relaxed. Now, ATF kind of kind of stepped on that themselves. There was one night where uh, the guy I called Pedro in the book, he came out and bought some guns, and he said, "Mike, Mike, somebody followed me all the way from your house to my house." And I said, okay, what kind of car were they driving? And he said, it was a great pickup truck. And I said to him, I said, oh, well, you know, cops don't drive pickup trucks. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, well, if they arrest somebody, they can't put them in the back. And he actually bought it. I mean, <laughs> so then I turned it around. I said, hey. Um, it's Arizona. <laughs> I, I, said, yeah. I said to him, I said, you know, what you need to start thinking about is, who knows you got all this money and who knows you got this gun? Somebody's going to rip you off. So it's not a cop. This is somebody, you know, mm -hmm. and then he got really paranoid about it. Um, but there were, there were other things like I mentioned, like the, the guy uh, shining the flashlight at the, the license plate while we're all inside an easy view and, and nobody seemed to notice it except me. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe they, you know, it's possible there's, there's like a matrix of things going on here. I mean, these guys could have been high, all kinds of stuff. And then also, you're not, you're not going to say this yourself, but, you know, I don't know if people could see it because obviously, you know, we're on cameras, we're sitting down. You're a pretty intimidating dude. You know, you're, no, you're a I tough don't. guy. You're like an old school tough guy. You look, you look the part, but you actually, you are that. Well, you know. I'll take that as a compliment, but um, I, I would talk 
tough in front of them. Like one night the, the guy was out here and he brought a girl to do the paperwork and they were talking in Spanish and the girl started laughing. And she said to me, she said, he just said that he thinks there's probably like 20 cops out there. And I said to him, I said, well, if somebody comes through that door without knocking, they're going to get a big surprise. And literally you could see the color drain from his face because even though he was buying these guns for cartel guys, he didn't want to be part of any yeah. shooting cops or, or anything right. like that, you know? And, uh, um, there was another time where, uh, a different girl was brought to do the paperwork so they could buy guns. And this was, they were associates, but a different cartel. And, uh, there were so many new players being brought to my house at that time that ATF was trying to shut down the smaller investigation so they could concentrate on the one big one, the one they called Operation Wide Receiver. Well, these people came out and they bought, uh, I think about 20 guns that night. They were all Rock River carbines, nice weapons. And uh, the guy loaded them in, in uh, nylon bags and put them over his shoulders and took them out to the to the truck <laughs> and I walked him out to the car and and they they stood and they stared and they could see the one card that the, the case agent usually sat in and she says I, I feel scared out here Mike I said no no you're well protected anytime you come to my house you're gonna be well protected don't worry about it so they followed him a, a couple miles away and they had a, a TPD Tucson police officer initiate a traffic stop mm -hmm. And the guy slowed to a roll, got out. He jumped over a bridge into a wash wow. and actually actually got away. But the, the little girl was so fat, she, <laughs> she, couldn't, she couldn't run. She stayed in the car, yeah. <laughs> so they, they got her on the sidewalk. And and um, so they took, a, they took her downtown to question her. And she's not talking and she's not talking. And finally, the case agent gets really mad. And he said, look we're going to charge you for every one of those guns. And here's the penalty you're facing. You're never going to see your kids again. You're not going home tonight. It's going to be years before you get out of this mess. And she broke down. She started crying. And now this is like three hours later. And she says, please, please don't tell Mike he'll kill us all. <laughs> and she pulled the receipt out of her bra. She had a receipt for the, the, the 20 rock river rifles in her bra. And but he called me the next day. He said, you're going to get a laugh out of this. They, they think you're a stone cold killer. Yeah. I said, well, let's let them keep thinking that. Then. Yeah, so. that that probably saved your life, man. I mean, and you, you know, you look apart. I'm not I'm not trying to big you up, man. And you can you know, you could easily be in movies. You are actually a tough guy. You're a Marine, right? I was briefly Marine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and you play football. You're a fit guy. I mean, even nowadays, you're like working out. <laughs> I, I, I work out. I work out every day. I do. I yeah. do enjoy. And breakouts. you box and all that. That's why I'm trying to do a documentary. You guys to see this dude is out there. But he, I don't think you want to mess with Mike at all. Well, you see, see what what will make the people laughing that that knew me in high school was I was a kid that wasn't allowed to take gym class or anything else in junior high. I had braces and crutches. Yeah, and you were stuff. like the Captain America story, man. Yeah, right. no, I just, I just got, I got tired of people shitting on me, and uh, they're about the junior year of high school. I hung a heavy bag in my, in my basement. My dad had, had uh, coach, uh, had been a boxer and had coached professional boxers along the way and stuff. So we'd spend every evening down there, and he would show me the basics and the combinations and stuff. And uh, um, you know, I, I worked myself up into a pretty good shape that I, I thought I could lie my way and get into the Marines and and have a have a career that way and it just didn't work out that way but um, I enjoy working out and I enjoy being kind of having a metamorphosis of, of going from a little crippled kid into to somebody that looks healthy and acts healthy yeah you're, you're you, you know you not just you don't only just look the part. You are like a tough guy. I mean, where did you get this thing on your chin from? That alone scary. You know, there, there's a lot of rumors about that, but that was actually uh, I was five years old and climbing a ladder in my dad's workshop when the uh, uh, the bottom of the ladder came out. Wow. And instead of jumping off the ladder, I rode it all the way down, but it ended up hitting his workbench. Wow. about halfway down and and i hit it with my chin before anything else 
So, so you've had that since you were five years old? Yeah, it, it actually broke the bone all the way through. Wow. And, uh, and people still mess with you? Because I'm not messing with a dude that his chin looks like, you know, that makes you look like you don't want to hit this guy in the face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I appreciate you saying that. No, no, but the, quite the contrary, there have been plenty of people who have wanted to punch me in the face. And yeah. <laughs> so, um, and you're a nice guy. I mean, I know you, but you, and you're a nice guy, but you're old school, man. You're like one of those dudes, someone gets out of, out of pocket, he will just smack the crap out of them. <laughs> there were, you know, uh, the gun show years were not the happiest in my life, and I was usually pretty cranky there. And there, well, there was two or maybe three people that that got cracked. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Just, just 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 for general purposes and being stupid and yeah. and, and screwing with me. But I'll say this: is that I, I I usually treat people the way I'm treated, and I try to be the nicest guy in the world. But when somebody tries to play you a fool or, or or goes out of their way to mess with you, then it's a whole different story. And that's kind of kind of why I wrote the book, because I felt like ATF went out of their way to screw me and not uh, you know, pull people. I'll, I'll give them the sad ending, which is after Brian Terry was uh, well, actually, it was before Brian Terry was killed. Uh, President Obama's Department of Justice sent out a prosecutor to prosecute this case, wide receiver. It had already been declined by uh, two, two Tucson assistant U.S. attorneys, and they declined it because ATF lied to the U.S. attorneys when this case was going on about uh, the Mexican authorities cooperating with the case. And the, those two U.S. attorneys weren't going to take this case to court based on a lie. The, the whole investigation was based on a lie mm -hmm. and they weren't going to sacrifice their personal integrity to do it. Yeah. So yeah. somehow this prosecutor comes out from Washington and all she wants to do is put a win up on a scoreboard. And the way that she was able to accomplish that was she was able to get everybody, 30 people that were arrested through the three different cases I brought them gave them the opportunity to plead guilty. And what they pled guilty to was lying on their form 4473, which is the form you fill out for your background check. Yeah, because I think people were asking in the, I, I haven't, I'm getting to the to the comments or questions that people are asking, but I know people were asking if there was paperwork and you did, you followed the ATF rules on, on these transactions, right? So there they, was they paperwork. They had to do paperwork. And here's the thing is, they had to bring me somebody who could pass the background check so I could transfer the guns because it wasn't just, Hey, these guys are coming and uh, let's load up the guns. You give me the money. We're not going to do any paperwork. Um, yeah. I mean, and, so these were straw purchases for the most part. So the, it would have been legal, except I already knew on my part that these they were buying guns for somebody else. I mean, right. just, we, we knew that. And so anyhow, instead of, illegal importation of firearms into Mexico or whatever. These people were charged with lying on their 4473s and they had lawyers stupid enough not to not to push for their own trials and not to say, uh, you know, we were set up and this was all, all part of an ATF conspiracy to take guns across the border into Mexico so they could have new regulations here in the United States. No, they had these stupid lawyers who were, were overburdened with too many cases and they had an opportunity to serve three years for lying on their 4473, and their lawyers talked them into going for it. With one exception, a guy that pushed for his own trial and got it, they went right up to the day they were supposed to select a jury before ATF dropped the charges on that guy. Now, if the other lawyers had been as smart, um, Wow. It, it would have ended up the same way. So anyway, this this lady, this prosecutor that was sent out from Washington, her name was Laura Gwynn. In my book, I call her Lori Beavertooth because she had some honking big teeth. Mm -hmm. And uh, they sent her out. And as soon as she got my journal, which was a journal I kept every day, and after every buy, I would enter information, as much detailed information about the purchasers, and where they said these guns were going, the gun serial numbers, what type of guns, what time they got here, what time they left, what type of vehicle they had. I mean, all of that stuff. When she saw how detailed that was, she knew 
that I was going to be a problem yeah. because here's a guy that not only did he have this extensive journal, because I bought my own digital recorder to cut to, um, uh, record these guys because the, the cassette recorder would have liked to get me killed one night. I bought my own digital recorder. You mean the, the agent's one or the official, like the ATF one almost yeah. got you caught, right? Or Yeah, because uh, well, something, something happened. Either I put the tape in upside down or, or something, but the remember the old cassette recorders, you had to push two buttons down at one time to record. Yeah. And then when you hit the end of the tape, they would pop up with a loud. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, that, that actually happened in my living room one night. So I spent 70 bucks and I bought an Olympus digital recorder. Still got it, still use it. But for those agents to get a CD of the recording, I had to download it to my hard drive and then burn a CD from, from the hard drive. Well, this prosecutor is like, holy fuck. <laughs> he's, he's got all this shit on his hard drive. Yeah, no joke. <laughs> and it's it's going to be bad for us if you know if yeah. you know if this goes public. And a couple months later, sure enough, Brian Terry gets shot with a Fast and Furious gun. So one day, actually, when I started writing my book, uh, I went back to listen to a conversation of a, one of these buys one night, and I went to the folder and I I clicked on a file. And it says file deleted or damaged. I thought, oh, that's weird. You know, maybe I did something screwy. And click on another file, file deleted or damaged. Everything in that folder had been corrupted. Yeah, so mysteriously thought, well, corrupted, not not deliberately yeah, by you on your part. Mysteriously. So I was like, well, I might be able to, some of the, the shorter phone conversations and some of the shorter meetings, uh, I could attach to an email and send the case agent. Uh, to his private Yahoo account, and uh, he ha also had two other email addresses that were DOJ and one was ATF, but um, those had restrictions on file size, but his Yahoo account, I could usually send like a 10-minute phone conversation, so I thought, well, I'll retrieve some of them that way. Well, once you know, every one of those emails had, was missing, gone, just gone, no yeah. explanation for it. So we're pretty oh. sure that they uh, hacked you, right? So, well, here's the thing. So I sent that lady an email, Laura Gwynn, and I said, hey, if you needed those files, I would have been happy to provide them to you. All you had to do was ask. And she sends me back a snotty email that said, I wasn't any part of this. I didn't order anybody to do it. Nobody, to the best of my knowledge, did it. If you think that somebody hacked your computer, I would urge you to contact local police. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing. She's a prosecutor on a major federal investigation. My hard drive is the original source for the for evidence. Yeah, in, that, would, that should be a big concern to her. And she didn't launch an investigation. So what's what did that tell me? You know, she's just lying through her teeth and they're doing everything possible to cover their tracks. You know, not much later after that, they sent out two people from from industry ops to do a uh, in audit, you know, to check my, my books and stuff. And all of a sudden I've got 80 guns that are missing and unaccounted yeah. for. Right. And they're so telling the, me so they, they sent out folks from, from the ATF now to try to like shut you down. Right. Or, or yeah. get federal so, charges pressed against you as a, take, as a FFL. Take my license. And they said would probably prosecute me. The only problem was those guns weren't missing. They were here. These two idiots that they sent out were told not to count, you know, to, to leave some serial numbers missing. Mm -hmm. So we got that straight now. You know, there are just so many missteps on their part. It's like, yeah. you know, it's, it's like if you wanted to take a bunch of seven graders and, and invade Cuba and take over Cuba, it's like, well, you know, you might, might have the right intent, you might have the right energy, but they're just too stupid. Yeah. And there were a number of things where they tried to tried to screw with me like that and they just ended up stepping on it themselves. Yeah. Uh, so just for anyone who knows who's listening to this on audio or whatever, I mean, you, you, you do have several dogs <laughs> and this is, uh, this is, this is Arizona. So you got to leave like a nice hard floor if you want it to stay cool. <laughs> so your guard, your, your monster guard dogs are walking back and forth. I'm not complaining or anything, but people find that very amusing. <laughs> You, you can hear that, huh? Yeah, it's 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 totally cool. Not bothering me. Let's um, go ahead. Let let me 
run and let that one because she's pacing in front of the door. Yeah, she's waiting. She's like, how many times do I have to walk by before you open the door? <laughs> let me oh, out. <laughs> yeah, Mike is a serious dog guy. Yeah, you know, he loves his dogs. So, yeah. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing he's got those dogs there with him. They're kind of like his security system. So, um, uh, I am you know, I am going to get to some questions. So let me uh, let me get to some questions for people. So first of all, um, uh, Mike, what is this? Mike Bullis would like to know how old you are. If that's okay, if that's not being rude. How sure. Old are you? I'm fifty eight. Fifty eight. Okay. Fifty eight. Right. I was born in 1958. Okay, very cool. So, how long did did it take for you to get into the Marines? This is from Jake Arnold, I think. And how long were you a Marine? I, uh, well, mentally, I was preparing myself through it all through uh, uh, last year high school and junior college. When I came out to Arizona, I enrolled in the PLC program, um, uh, which is doesn't really amount to anything other than. Uh, um, they try to help you get ready uh, for OCS. And I went through OCS in 1982 and then started TBS. I got pulled from training at TBS because of my bad ankle. And uh, uh, I think about 14 months later, I was discharged. Uh, so I'm not actually a veteran. I didn't, I didn't serve enough time uh, consistent, uh, consecutive active duty to, to be called a veteran. Uh, well, I'm still very proud to, to know that I was a Marine, um, even though I was never deployed, never sent overseas, never picked up a platoon of men. I was a second lieutenant, and uh, uh, I'm still very happy to have that association with the Marine Corps. Yeah, I think you should be proud of that. And, and you know, to me, um, one of the things I like about you and, and your whole – you're like an all-American dude, man. I don't think they make guys like you anymore. Um, do you want to talk a little bit like, you know, even your family history, your, your dad is like a known guy in the football world, right? Yeah, that dad was really an interesting guy. He, uh, he loved sports. He, you know, his, his mom was a nurse and, uh, his dad wasn't around ever. So he was pretty much raised by, by a little town in Kansas called Goodland. And, uh, Everybody there was great to him because they all knew my my grandmother who worked at the local nurse at, at the local hospital as a nurse. And uh, when she was busy doing that stuff, there were people that were feeding my dad or taking him to compete at sports events or, um, you know, just giving him food. That was the main thing, you know, growing up during the uh, uh, depression was, uh, you know, uh, to the day he died, he wouldn't eat potato soup, and it wasn't because it wasn't tasty or anything. It was because he had it like six days yeah. out of seven, and yeah. about the sixth day, it was watered down so bad, it was really just warm soup with a potato peel in it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, during high school, he started reading, and I forget the author's name. He had written a, a series of books about the French Foreign Legion, and that really intrigued him and thought got his gears turning about being a professional soldier. In fact, one time he told me he had written the, uh, uh, the French embassy in Washington, DC for information about how to become a member of the French foreign legion. <laughs> <laughs> in, uh, 1938, there was a Marine that came through town. Um, and he asked my dad, he said, where are these fights? He was looking at a poster. Uh, he said that, well, the fights are going to be at the, the high school gymnasium tomorrow night. And he said, uh, he said, do you know the promoter? And my dad took him to the promoter and this guy signed up to fight one of the local heavyweights who was a, like a local legend. And everybody thought this poor Marine was just going to get his, his butt beat. And he destroyed the guy, decimated him, just really <laughs> turned him from local legend and <laughs> Into somebody that went into hiding for for a while. Mince me, mince me. And uh, this Marine had given my dad a copy of uh, the Leatherneck, which is a, a monthly magazine that's for Marines, current and old Marines, and so forth. And Dad was looking at, it and he saw that MCRD Marine Corps, Marine Corps Recruit Depot San Diego had an undefeated football team and boxing team that year, and. Uh, uh, he kind of lost any thought of the French Foreign Legion. So he went through the process to uh, uh, 
get in the Marine Corps, which at that, I don't know what it is now, but they actually sent letters to uh, the local sheriff of the, the county that he lived in. And uh, he had to get something from his principal at high school. And then he had to take that entire package to Denver where he got a fiscal and eventually got orders and uh, enlisted in 1939. Wow. And uh, so when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7th, December 7th, 1941, they also attacked Midway Island, and he was a buck sergeant on Midway Island at that time. Uh, that was the first battle of Midway. To say, he was also there for the second battle of Midway. And after the second battle, they sent him back to Quantico. He got a, uh, uh, Quantico, Virginia, he got a commission to warrant officer and then came back and he was involved in the island landings at Tarawa and Saipan. Wounded on Saipan and uh, broke his back and uh, got out late. <laughs> he got a, a started at 100% disability. I think it was down to 75 by the time uh, he died. But um, during that time, he played pro football and boxed professionally. And then uh, also got a college education on the GI Bill as a uh, physical therapist. And then became an athletic trainer. And uh, in the early 60s, he got the job as the head athletic trainer for the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, I grew up just outside of Philadelphia in a little suburb called King of Prussia. Most people know that uh, that town for their mall. We had, yeah, yeah, King of Prussia Mall. Used to be one of the world's biggest. I think right now it's, it's probably not even in the top 10, but the, the Mall of America. Uh, kicked them down a few a few notches but mm -hmm. uh, that's where I grew up and and uh, yeah your dad was like famous he was known he you know he was the athletic trainer for the Eagles right and he trained boxers as well yeah he was uh, uh, dad trained a guy um, named Ed Sanders who uh, now this uh, dad was the head coach at the Navy recruit depot and uh, from 1950 to 1953 I think as well as an athletic trainer. And one of the, the fighters that they had recruited was named Ed Sanders. Ed Sanders won the 1952 Olympic gold medal. Tremendous athlete. I mean, he would have been successful playing football or basketball or any sport. He just chose boxing. And uh, he defeated Ingemar Johansson in the 52 Olympics to get the gold medal. Ingemar Johansson was later the heavyweight, gold, uh, heavyweight champion. Floyd Patterson uh, was on the team with, with uh, on the Olympic team with Ed, and he was the only one that, that was able to, to spar with him because of this tremendous hand speed. He was later heavyweight champion at the world. Um, Sonny Liston, uh, Ed Sanders had beat uh, as, an, as an amateur, mm -hmm. uh, who was later heavyweight world champion. So there were, there was just no doubt that this person was going to be heavyweight champion of the world at some point in time. Unfortunately, he had a, uh, a brain aneurysm and, and passed away before any of that could happen. Yeah. And you grew up with all of this, right? You grew up seeing, well, a lot, you know, not all of it, obviously. I'm sure you weren't there when your dad was going through World War II, but no, no, but it, it, and I mean, that was, you know, that was my parents. They were part of that, that greatest generation. And yeah. And, it, and your mom's still here. I know your dad's not here, but your mom's still here. Mom, mom's still here. She's 92 now. And, and she grew up with, uh, I mean, she grew up during depression. She was five years younger than dad, but I mean, the war affected everybody during those years. Maybe today's generation doesn't realize it, but you know, food was actually rationed. Gasoline was rationed. Um, mom Everything. along with, her, with yeah. the, the flag girls in high school, they would have, you know, collect tin and, and, and rubber and, and, and stuff that was used for the war effort, uh, because meat was rationed. They had a, a rabbit hutch behind the house. Her and her brothers knew how to, to skin and butcher rabbits and, and they would keep the rabbits, you know, for additional source of protein. They had a little victory garden, you know, they raised cabbage and lettuce and carrots and stuff in the backyard there, like everybody else. And and it wasn't because they were poor or anything. It was because they were doing their part. Her dad was a, a, a well-known internist in San Diego and they had money and stuff, but they were still doing their part. Um, 
that's just the way it was then. That was, you know, that's why we call it the greatest generation. Yeah, I mean, I, I got into all of this because I wanted people to know that genuinely, uh, I'm sure people out there are asking, like, what's your motivation to do this? How did you wind up doing this? You know, maybe some people are like, hey, you should have never dealt with the government, never trusted the government. I think you would agree with that. But your motivation, I think, came from two places, right? One of them, I think, is the fact that you're like an all-American, you, you know, you're, you're the salt of the earth American kind of, you know, people won't, don't really believe anyone like you exists anymore. But this is really what you were, right? So that's one part of it. I, I did it because I felt like it was the right thing to do. And as one of the agents told me, he said, you know, Mike, we could have got somebody undercover and tried to run them into these people that you were dealing with. Mm -hmm. And maybe it would have happened, but maybe it wouldn't have happened. But you were already there and you seemed willing to take on the risk and you were getting us good information and you just seemed to be fearless. So why would we do that? Yeah. And so to get to the other part, and I am I am getting to everyone's questions, but I really want to establish this. I think the other part of why you did this is like there was like a perfect storm of things that happened to you at that time in your life. And you were feeling a little bit dangerous. I, I was. I mean, I, you know, I never felt like I was probably more than 100 heartbeats away from pulling the trigger. I mean, I would just, I, uh, uh, you know, I, I'd lost a job. I'd, I'd, I'd had a, a, a job with the family business. My dad was, uh, uh, while he was still a trainer, he invented the neoprene braces that you see the athletes wearing and actually uh, used to make them on my mom's old sewing machine. Mm -hmm. and then la later hired a, a wetsuit but that became a full-time business he quit the eagles and, and had that business and i worked for him 17 years selling the drugstore and sporting goods store chains you guys His built product. a pretty pretty decent business it was a successful company and it, i mean it wasn't huge but it took care of my family it took care I, at one time i had a, another brother involved in the business and a sister involved in the business and you know my mom was at least on paper, an employee, and uh, uh, you know, took good care of me, my wife, my stepson, and uh, you know, we had company cars, and we our health insurance was paid for, is, is just part of the job, and so forth. Um, uh, then my brother got control of the company and fired me, and my dad knew it was going to happen and allowed it to happen, but he was so afraid my brother was going to bankrupt the company. Um, and that the, the bank would come after my mom to repay the line of credit. And so my, my mom's house, her investments and everything would have been effective unless my brother assumed that line of credit. And that was the deal that he made. He said, well, I'm not going to keep Mike around. And uh, that was, that, that was of, a tough blow, right? That was uh, tough to deal with. And then the next one was my, uh, uh, my wife went and got a job and, you know, not, not much later, uh, uh, she had hooked up with a, a guy that was married and, um, they both got divorced at the same time. She divorced me and, uh, uh, that, that was, that was a pretty tough kick in the balls. I, uh, don't feel like I ever fully recovered from, from that. And, uh, the same week she moved out, I started a, a 12 month course of interferon uh, to cure hepatitis that I'd gotten through a, a blood transfusion. And uh, that screwed me up really bad because the interferon, I don't know what it's like now, but the, the medicine they gave me at that time was a very heavy antidepressant. And even though they were giving me antidepressants with it, it, uh, it was hard to, to have anything to smile or laugh at. I mean, there, there was just nothing that was really going well in my life at that time. So when I had an opportunity to work with ATF, I mean, secretly I, in my mind, I was maybe one of these little pricks will shoot me, uh, just put me out of my misery. And uh, so because of that, because of the, like you said, the perfect storm of bad things happening to me, um, uh, I was completely fearless. I mean, if these guys want to shoot me, go ahead. Shoot yeah. me right. Shoot me right here. I, I mean, that's, how, have to that's be, how much I cared. 
Yeah, I think it's like a movie. It, 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 I mean, it really reads like a movie to me. And when people are thinking, man, there's no way I would do this. Yeah, if, if, if everything's coming at you from all sides and then something like this shows itself, and even though there's that thing in your brain like this is not going to go well, there's something else in your brain that's like, okay, bring it on. Yeah. I think as men, we all know we've been there. I mean, this is what this is kind of like the fire that makes your metal as a man if you actually come through something like this. And um, I don't all of us don't go through what you did where you actually had like these bad guys, you know, sitting in your house, sitting outside your house, knowing where you lived and 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 the kind of money and guns like that and things that you had around. Um it's really like something from out of a movie. Yeah, you, you know, and, and what also bo bolstered that was uh, the people that came to see me. I mean, they're right out of central casting. I mean, with with the ostrich skin boots and ostrich belt and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the designer jeans and stuff. I mean, they look like they were were picked actors that would be perfect for that part. And, uh, it was a, you know, my, my life became a, a, a bad movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just, I, and I, I, you know, even a year and a half into it, two years into it, three years into it, I had no idea what the ending was going to be. Yeah. So let me, let me hit some of the questions because Lola's going to smack me if I don't get to the questions. Okay. So the Tyvin show wants to know, was the tracking like RFID tracking or what was their idea? Because even right now we can't track stuff like this. So what was the idea behind this tracking? No, initially they want, I mean, they said they wanted to see where these guns were going. Although uh, just in, in casual, casual conversation with these people, they would tell me exactly where they were going. They would tell me what families they're going to. ATF already had the intelligence on, you know, who the top leaders on those, those cartels were in, in the area of their operations. I mean, so really the whole tracking thing is just kind of a, it's a bogus thing. The fact that it didn't work was not a big deal to them at all. They, I mean, they knew what cities and so forth they were going to and who they were going yeah. to. And then uh, when they started showing up at crime scenes and usually, you know, the way you leave at a crime scene is because you, you can't hold it anymore, which means either you got arrested or you got shot. Um, they, they had a great idea of where these guns were going. They, they certainly knew who they were going to and where those people were. Yeah. So uh, our RFIDs, no. Uh, the tracking device that, that we tried to put in that Yugo was probably eight inches long and about two, two and a half inches in diameter. Uh, but like I said, you know, we had to wrap that antenna around it to make it fit inside the buttstock and it, it just wouldn't work. Yeah, that's, that's, I, don't, I can't even believe that they actually seriously considered that. Um, and you no. know we're talking several years ago. Well, this, this is point, yeah, you know. this is this is ten years ago, and whether they have that technology now, I don't know. I and I I said to him, I said, why don't you guys go to DEA and borrow some of their stuff? And they were like, yeah, their stuff's worse than ours. So <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know where all their their money for technology goes, but it, it certainly wasn't the transmitter that they gave me to use that would burn my leg and turn itself off. Yeah. Um, now they did have they did have tracking units they put on cars, and they were bigger. They were about the size of a football. And uh, I remember on one case they uh, the case agent couldn't come sit outside my house for a buy that was going on because he had to drive to Phoenix and replace the batteries in that that tracking unit that was attached to another guy's car <laughs> up in Phoenix. So that's how crazy things were. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's crazy. Okay, let me hit another question here. What do you think, this is uh, from Sugar Bear, he wants to know, what do you think was really behind the small arms treaty signed by Obama? No idea. I, I mean, yeah. I, 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 I'd be that's, afraid uh, to that's, say. Yeah, that's, what, that's the whole deal that went down with the UN, I believe, um, right? I, I don't know. I, I mean, if, yeah. if, I, if I made a comment, it, it would just show my ignorance about that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that these guys, there's a lot of craziness going on here in this story, if you think about it. And um, just like uh, right now, we're getting an exposure to what happens in politics and how there's like there's all these conflicting things going on inside of one administration. Um, and, and, and what, something telling here is that these guys were doing this and Mexico had zero ideas because, yeah. 
you know, these this, this was killing Mexican citizens. Still, Absolutely. still killing Mexican citizens at this point. And, and, and think about this. The, the people who came up with this, I'll call it a plot, because it certainly was an investigation. Um, the people that came up with this put, put Mexican life secondary to achieving new anti-gun regulations here in the United States. Yeah. Uh, how, how screwed up is that? I mean, yeah. uh, I mean if, you, if you go back 10 years ago and, and come forward and look at like so many Mexican citizens, so many people lost loved ones, family, you know, all kinds of stuff. Obviously we lost people here in America, but they lost way more. I mean, there was yeah. a, this was like, this, this was mass murder that was going on here. And America was actually, actually facilitating it. And Mexico didn't have any idea that that was going down. Yeah. 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 So that should show you something about the administration. And at the same time, the administration was trying to tell us that we couldn't have guns legally to protect ourselves. Right. So and, and, and Hillary's Hillary's response was, well, 90 percent of the guns in Mexico are because of um, illicit gun dealers in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I know that there was a bunch of stuff that Obama and the administration was going along with. Uh, with the UN, you know, where they were making deals with the UN on on what our rules should be, <laughs> you know, right. all of it, un, you know, unconstitutional, definitely against the Second Amendment, and yet these people, for everything that they were saying, when they get up there and they, and, you know, and they talk about these poor kids in Chicago, you know, there was this the famous case of this girl that I think danced at his inauguration. This young girl that danced at, at his inauguration that was killed by gun violence, and then we are. The government, government sanctioned transfer of these guns over to Mexico that killed tens of thousands of people in Mexico, you know, and then and then like nowadays they want to say that uh, Trump, you know, is, is messed up and doing messed up stuff to Mexico. He, he never did anything like this. No, no, sure hasn't. Yeah. You know, even Mexico hates Trump. Well, well, Trump Trump never sent any guns across the, the border to kill your citizens. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm sure they still see Obama as some kind of like hero or some, some craziness, man. It's insane. Why, you know, why Mexico didn't show greater outrage? Now that, that BBC show, The Secrets of Mexico, Drugs War, Drug War, uh, they interview people that were at a birthday party, all high school kids. Mm -hmm. And cartel guys mistook it for a cartel party. And they went in and they shot the shit out of these kids. There was like 20 kids killed. Yeah, I saw it. They were kids. They were like adults who were trying to shield children that they just killed the adults, killed the children. I mean, you know, I mean, why, why is there not like war crime tribunals going on right now? Why, why is Obama like on vacation somewhere surfing and all this kind of stuff? Yeah. You it's, know, uh, Where, yeah. where's like Eric Holder and all these people? Yeah, our attorney general, who was actually charged with contempt by Congress. Yeah, um, and it, folks don't understand that this investigation is still going on, right? A lot of this is like uh, the news is tamped down with all the fake news that we're getting about Russia and all that kind of bullshit. But this, but there's still investigations going on in what we're talking about right now. Yeah, there, there are, and and the thing is, is that every time somebody gets killed with one of those guns, it's going to be in the news again. I mean, it's it's not like these guns have expiration periods, you know, where they go bad after a couple of months. These things will will keep uh, keep killing for quite a while, unfortunately. Yeah. OK, let's keep hitting up the questions here. Um, so 803 Salad Shooter wants to know, were there any NFA items transferred? No. And with that being said, the first group of kids that I ran into were buying AR-15 lowers. They were taking them over to San Diego, and somebody in San Diego was ordering off the internet 10-inch uh, top ends and completing that gun, making it a, a complete short-barreled rifle, and then taking them across the border into Tijuana for the uh, Felix Ariano uh, cartel. Uh, at one point in time, they were trying to, to figure out if they wanted me to supply those short top ends, and the U.S. attorney told them that they didn't want the CI giving them both parts of what would become an illegal weapon. So we never, never went that route. Yeah. 
I think they did try to, I think there was something in your book that they tried to go do, turn some of these into machine guns. That was uh, one of the people that I dealt with told me that they were doing that and we were never able to confirm that or find that if that was the case where they were doing it at. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so like the way that all this was going down, since it, there was actual paperwork and everything going on here, for you to keep up the ruse also, I mean, because if you go buy something that's NFA, you have to buy it, fill out your paperwork, and then sit there and wait. There's no way they're doing that. Yeah. Yeah. But once these things were in their hands, who knows what the hell they did with them at that point. Yeah. Now, there, there was another guy that bought um, quite a few Rock River AR-15 pistols from me. And then he bought butts, also bought buttstock kits from me and took it to whoever was working on the guns for him in Mexico to... At, at which point in time they, you know, replaced the, the, the buffer with a uh, receiver extension and and collapsing buttstock and made an SBR. So that that was it as far as NFA stuff. Yeah. Okay. So here's um. Let me. So this is from Mark Wagner. He wants to know: Are you concerned for your well-being from the cartel and the government? Actually, uh, I think I have more to fear from the government based on what they've attempted in the past. I, it's been a while since I, I had any inkling that they were trying to screw with me. But, uh, you know, I do what I can to stay prepared. We're talking about 2010, seven years ago was the last year that I was active with ATF on any investigation. The thing is that 30 people went to prison. Um, because of information I helped ATF gather and helped DOJ prosecute. And I have to figure it out 30 people. There's, there's at least a couple that are still very unhappy with me about them having done jail time. Um, I do what I need to, to, to stay safe. Yeah. Have any of these guys, obviously they knew where you were. I mean, maybe they've had time to think about it. There's definitely been books. If they didn't, um, if they didn't Google you then, do you, you know, do you ever worry about any of these guys Googling you now? Well, here's the thing is that prosecutor from Washington. I mean, when I got involved in, in operation wide receiver, the one thing the assistant special agent in charge down here in Tucson told me his name was Chuck Higman. And, uh, said, Mike, whatever it comes to, if it, if it looks like somehow your identity is, is going to come out, he says, well, just drop the case. He says, you're that important to us. We're not, we're not going to put your life at risk uh, just to prosecute a case. Well, when that prosecutor, Laura Gwynn, came out from Washington, the first thing she did was sent discovery to the people they'd arrested. And in that discovery, it named me by name as the confidential informant. So there's no second guessing it. They, yeah. they, they knew got- absolutely. As soon as their lawyers looked at that paperwork, they're like, oh, this, this is the guy that's been writing me out. Yeah. So, I mean, I I don't, you know, I don't want you to discuss it or anything like that, but for people out there who are worried, you know, you are taking steps to, uh, to keep yourself safe and secure. I do all I can, but I mean, if you want to live, you can't live a life of fear. You have to, you know, at some point in time, I have to go grocery shopping or take the dogs to the vet or go to church or go out to dinner or just go out, pick up the mail, my mailbox. But, uh, I can't let my world be dominated by fear and I just I just refuse to but I am a gun guy that's that's the fortunate thing and I have lots of guns and I carry guns almost all the time and um, Mm -hmm. you know the sad reality is is that somebody could shoot me from down the street with a deer rifle when I go out to get the mail it's just just the way it is yeah hopefully they've just moved on Um, Joe Carpenter wants to know what do you do now Right now, my uh, sole means of income is writing for gun magazines. I work for uh, Athlon Media. They they bought all of the old Harris titles like Combat Handguns and Guns and Weapons for Law Enforcement and Special Weapons. I think they've probably got about 40 different titles. And I also work uh, for American Rifleman. Okay, very cool. So you're still out there um, doing gun reviews, writing. Um, Obviously, you wrote this book. Got any other books in the works? I'm working on a book. It's not gun related. It's actually about dogs. And uh, I keep thinking that uh, 
it'll come out the following year, but I've been thinking that for the last four years. So it's, uh, I, I'm You're a doing big research. Dog. Yeah, this is why you have a lot of dogs, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big dog guy. And, you know, the, when you sit down to write about one of, one of your great dogs that you've lost, I, I spend more time crying than I do typing. So it's, uh, um, I think it'll, anybody that's ever, ever shed a tear over a dog or cried when they saw an old yeller, I think it'll be a book that will interest them. If you've never had a dog and if you're a cat person, you probably will just want to avoid it. But um, it's, uh, it's, it's about, you know, where does it, when that dog dies, where does that energy goes? And are we ever going to be reconnected again? Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, for a dog lover, I think it'll be an interesting book. Yeah, cool. I look forward to that. I think that's a good thing for you to do. If someone out there is going to write the book, it should be you on dogs. I know you have a very special relationship, you know. Um, so uh, Jackson Oldman wants to know what's your what's a what's a favorite gun that you own? Gosh, I you know I got a lot of them. Um, a gun that I shoot the most is probably my Guncrafter American that Alex Zimmerman built for me. I met him at uh, at a Blue August meeting maybe seven years ago, and he had some of the prototypes of that gun there. If if you don't know Guncrafter, they're the ones that came out with the 50 caliber in 1911 that that uh, a lot of people were drooling over for years. Uh, I had him build my gun in 45 ACP, and I used it for a couple seasons of USPSA competition before I had my ankles replaced. I haven't really shot a match since then, but I shoot a lot when I go to training classes, when I go up to gun site, uh, it's a gun that I take with me because I've never had a failure with it. Guns never jammed. It's never done something it shouldn't have done. Uh, the only part I've ever had to replace on that gun has been a recoil spring. And uh, so it's my go-to gun. I have a lot of other neat guns that I enjoy. I like the SBRs. I've got three guns, three SBRs around the house that I built. I think you had a chance to shoot one when you were out here. Yep. Uh, they're fun to shoot. Uh, the, the Discovery team that was just out here filming with me, I took them out and let them shoot that. Um, what was Discovery doing out there? Was it related to the books? Yes, uh, they're doing they're actually doing a documentary on gun trafficking. Uh, the principal of the show, his name is uh, David Berrine. Uh He's a, a Spaniard, as was the, the rest of the production crew. Uh, and he has a show called Clandestino, or Clandestine in, in English. And last year he was down uh, with FARC in Colombia. And one of the guns that one of the, the gorillas had was uh, an American gun. And at that time, it gave him the idea, well, how, how did that American gun get all the way down into Columbia? Mm -hmm. So his research team uh, started doing some work on gun trafficking. And somehow my name came up, and he read the book and everything. So he made arrangements to come out here and uh, spend a couple of days with me last, uh, two weeks ago. We did some filming at a, uh, a gun show in Albuquerque uh, that allowed him to film. And uh, so I think it'll be a neat show. Uh, they're in negotiations right now to have uh, an English version. He speaks very good English. Um, an English version come on to Discovery Channel. I think right now this uh, clandestino, there's probably five or six of them that you can find online. Uh, and he did a three-part series on the Sinaloa and the cartel. Okay, so, very cool. Yeah. yeah, when that comes out, let us know so that we could check it out. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I think that would be pretty cool. And you know, like I said before, we, you know, we have access to you. We've done some stuff. I, I need to uh, put it together. Maybe um, try to get something going out there where we can get some people to get behind us and tell this story. I think from a gun guy's point of view, because. I think it's a cautionary tale that everyone in America really needs to hear, but I mean, specifically gun guys, we need to see what happens when you're a good guy and you try to do the right thing. You know, you know I, I have to say I'm disappointed that, that the NRA, excuse me, NRA didn't jump on this story when, when it, when the book first came out four years ago. And, um, 
because there's so many people talking about taking away our rights because crime is being committed with guns. Well, here's the thing. Uh, if it was that simple, if we could pass a gun law that would stop gun violence, why can't we just pass a law that says murder is illegal? Because that would stop murder, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Us using the same logic. But when, when people are trying to take responsible gun owners and say that they are responsible for the gun violence, and we know they're saying that because these gun laws that they pass only affect the honest and responsible gun owners. Criminals, by definition, are not going to follow any law. We know yeah. that. So um, why take our rights away when we're not the ones committing crimes with these guns? But my story, I mean, I mean, I really was hoping NRA would jump on it because here we have an honest American citizen who was trying to do the right thing and his government actually used them as, as, a, as a pawn in, in their goal to achieve more gun regulation here in the United States. And it should be a cautionary tale for people. I mean, we know that you have a lot of good American patriots, probably a lot of veterans that listen to your show because they're interested in guns. And the people who've told me that they've enjoyed my book the most are people who could see themselves easily getting involved with the government because one, the government told them they were needed and two, they thought they could help. They thought they could do something that would help make their country be a, a better place. And that was honestly really what I wanted to do. And that's what I, that's what all of our motivations are. I think a lot of people get it twisted outside of the Second Amendment community. You know, they think we're just bad guys and we just want to hurt people. And, you know, no, yeah. that's not why we do this. That's sure. not why we believe in this. That's not why we fight these fights. We want America to be a better place for us, for everyone out there. You know, yeah. we want to help our communities. We want them to be, you know, we want to see everyone thrive and grow. We're not, we're not out there seeking horrible things, you know? Um, you know, it's, it's true. I, I have a lot of high school friends on Facebook. And unfortunately, I had to unfriend probably five or six of them because uh, after Sandy Hook, you know, they were coming out and saying, well, NRA is just baby killers. They just want kids to die. And uh, if, if they want to make a ridiculous statement like that and put crap on their Facebook timeline about the NRA being baby killers and stuff, it, there's nothing I can say or do that's going to reason with them. So it's just easier to erase them from my friend list. Yeah, absolutely. That's what the, that's absolutely what I think you should do. <laughs> you know, um, so now, you know what? Um, let's uh, you know what? Let's hit the news for a little bit. Were you a, a Kenny Rogers uh, or I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Glenn not Campbell. Kenny Rogers. Were you a Glenn Campbell fan? You know, I have to say that made me yeah. cry a little bit today when I yeah. saw. It. Yeah. So we lost Glenn Campbell. Wow. Great guy. I mean, just an amazing voice and all American good looks. And uh, yeah. uh, it's unfortunately his his last few years, if not, have been very difficult for him and his family and his fans. Uh, and and the best thing I can think is probably he's in much better shape and a nicer place now. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's uh, the world is changing so drastically, you know. Um, sometime in the future when some of the stars that are out there right now, you know, I'm not wishing bad on anyone, but like when Justin Bieber goes or whatever, you know, 60, 70 years from now, it's not going to be like Glenn Campbell. I mean, you know, people might not even know who he is, but Glenn Campbell, you know, we all pretty much know who he is. I mean, he, he's, there was this time in America, right, where like music was for everyone you know, and all kinds of music, and we were all mixed up in our music. And then at some point in America, it seems like the, the music got separated and we got separated. Yeah. You know? and, it, and he, he was unusual in that while most of his music was classified as country, is that he still heard it on all the, you know, popular music channels um, mm -hmm. when, when his stuff was coming out there in the 60s and 70s. Um, everybody loved him. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that's, you know, that's that's pretty terrible news right there to see. Now, if um, so for, for folks out there who are, you know, hearing all of this and they want to somehow like, you know, show support for you and all that, what would you say is something that they can do to support you Buy the book? Give it a good read, share it. Maybe that's the thing, you know, uh, I've I've done a lot of book signings at SHOT Show as well as the NRA meetings and I've given the books away and, you know, normally that costs me money to do it. But what I always tell people is, hey, you know, do me a favor when you're done reading this, share this with like minded friends. It's not because uh, I don't want them to go out and buy their own book or whatever. I just want them to know what our government is capable of of putting some somebody through who only had the intention of doing what they told them to do, thinking that it was going to make our country a better place. And that was the, the, what happened to me was the reward I got for trying to do the right thing and doing what they told me to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So uh, now, uh, you know, let's go to some other news that's going on out here. What, what do you think about what's going on in North Korea, man? What would you do about that whole situation? Well, I think Trump made a, a, a comment today that said basically, hey, we're going to unleash the dogs on you if you don't stop this nonsense. And uh, it's got to be done. I mean, you know, how, mu how much more can we capitulate? And this guy's already showing us that he's unstable. Uh, and he's, he's already killed any any person who might be next in line to take his place if he dies so uh, what do you do with that and unfortunately just it looks like there might be some innocent people killed because this guy's a dick and, yeah and he has to but be he's dumb. not living it he's not he's not living in reality i don't think people in north korea are living in reality um i don't know if people in south korea are living in reality i mean are, aren't our winter games happening in south korea don't know, but they, they yeah. should be very afraid. I mean, you know, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're talking about ballistic missiles and intercontinental intercontinental ballistic missiles and nuclear stuff. And so, but they're in range for the, the conventional stuff. I mean, they, um, and you know, the North Koreans got that, that technology has been around since the thirties. So, yeah. So, so the 2017 winter Olympics is going to be held in Pyongyang in Seoul. Uh, you know, so that's going to be that's going to be in South Korea. <laughs> it was a, a nuclear winter. They might be able to have them all year long. Yeah, um, that's interesting. You know, um, oh, wait, uh, wait, uh, let's see. Um, let me. Yeah, it looks like, you know, if we're going to be holding games and stuff like that in that part of the world. At the same time that these guys are setting up, uh, you know, they're setting up in their and they're increasing their capability to strike America. So it, it's weird. It makes me wonder, like, is anything happening anytime soon? You know, and the worst thing, I think, is if uh, troops wind up going on the ground there, because that's not really going to be fun. Yeah. The, you know, I, I have to give credit to our intelligence community and, and hopefully we have the ability that when they roll that nuclear missile out onto the launch pad, that through some type of virus or something, we can have that thing blow up on the launching pad. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be, that would be the, the ideal scenario right there. Yeah. So now let me, I'm going to hit up some, uh, I'm going to hit up some questions here. Uh, 904 outdoors friend of ours wants to know what do you think about the auto glove have you heard of the auto glove I saw it I think on the firearms blog or uh, yeah <laughs> and, uh, you know like the like the slide fire and the other things out there it looks like it would be a fun toy you know if you if you don't own a full auto gun or you were never in the military and you kind of want to experience that then by all means but it's a toy yeah yeah I think um yeah, I don't know. I think there's there's better things out there. What do you think about these? Uh, there's like the binary trigger, the echo trigger. There's a couple of these triggers that, um, you know, when you pull, they fire. When you release, they fire. Do you think that's more practical or, I, you or, know, same, or is that in the same category for you? 
I think practical in that you could probably score better hits. Um, what is the need for it? I, I don't know. I'm not saying I, I own a full auto gun. I own a, a Thompson 1928 submachine gun mm -hmm. uh, that I bought really as an investment. And it's, it's worked out well that way because I bought it for $1,300 in 1986. And now it's upwards of 20,000, but um, uh, fast, accurate fire will be full auto fire in terms of hits anytime. So uh, the way I look at those things are, it's just, if somebody wants to, to buy some, some cheap ammo at, at, at the local Mart store and go out and blow through it. Then yeah. It's a good way. It's a good way to blow through some ammo. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, all I see is like your gun shooting a bunch of quarters full auto. <laughs> it's like, Get 22. Yeah. It's fun to shoot in 22s. If you put yeah, it in a 22. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So now I always promise people on my show that if they ask sexual questions, I will let them, you know, we'll answer sexual questions. No one's don't relax. No one's asked any like sexual advice stuff from you unless you want to give some advice. But uh, Jock Carpenter says to that question from 904 Outdoors where he says, what do you think about the auto glove? He says, and what do you think about lesbians? <laughs> well, I've, I've got to be really careful because I've got one in my family. So oh, well, OK, I like them. Yeah. Yeah, I like, yeah. I, I I like my girlfriends to be lesbians. <laughs> okay, so they there you go. You got an answer straight up still, from the man. Still holding out for a threesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know what? That's okay. <laughs> Let me tell you something. There's some things in life. Don't know whether or not you've ever actually done that. There's some things in life that are better in your head as a fantasy <laughs> than they are in reality. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's one of the few. I have not learned a lot in my life so far, but that's one of the things, man. Why do you keep looking at Lola? <laughs> yeah, I'm looking to see if I'm going to get smacked. <laughs> she, she's gone for the broom. Yeah, I'm looking to see if she's OK. So someone wants to know yay or, or nay on a career on an ATF career in today's world. <laughs> so I'm not sure. That's from who? Who? That's uh, Manuel Castro wants to know. Would you, would you ever go work for the ATF? Let me say this. Uh, I think any federal agency right now can use Spanish speakers. And Manuel, I, I assume you can speak some Spanish, so you you'll be in demand. I might look at some other agencies before ATF. Yeah. That being said. Uh, there are some tremendous ATF agents and I became disillusioned when after Brian Terry was killed that we had ATF leadership coming out and saying that they had never done what they did and that more agents between Tucson and Phoenix there was only one agent his name's John Dotson he's the only one that said oh wait a second yeah we did that yeah and he took and he paid a heavy price for that, John Dodds. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, you know the seven full-time agents that were here in Tucson that I worked with, uh, I lost every bit of respect I had for them when mm -hmm. they didn't come out and say, "Wait a second, yeah, we did do that. We need to own this." Mm -hmm. And I understand about careers, and I understand about your wife liking the school the kids are in, and understand about having a paycheck every two weeks. But the, to me, there's nothing more important than personal integrity. And mm -hmm. by saying nothing, uh, you can say, well, I didn't lie, but I'm going to look at you the same way. You didn't stand up and do what's right. And I lost complete respect for those agents. Some of them, I mean, I used to socialize with and go shooting with and stuff. And uh, uh, that all ended when uh, when the, the the Phoenix special agent in charge Bill Newell said he didn't do it and then the Department of Justice came out and said they didn't do it Eric Holder so uh, none of those people I have respect for anymore yeah now um, are you into yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry getting back to that question right Matt, well if, if if you are able to hook up with a federal agency even if it's ATF keep that in mind yeah you always have to do the right thing and 
sometimes you're going to take a terrible knock for it, uh, but you should never sacrifice your personal integrity. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I think at one point you wanted to be an FBI agent, right? That was my goal. I mean, my out of college, my career goal was to uh, go into Marines as an officer and then uh, uh, do a contract with them and or maybe maybe to, uh, uh, you know, get out as a first lieutenant or a captain and then, then go into the FBI. I wanted to be a federal agent. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's not not a bad career path still to go down. Right. The FBI is still, you know, they're that's a decent place if you're looking into that. I think you have to have uh, what is it? You have to have a bachelor's degree mm -hmm. and uh, some work experience. Obviously, get accepted into the class, which I think it's two of them every year. I think you're right. Yeah, every six months, and I think they only accept like 75 people, and most of those people wash out by the end of that. Yeah, yeah. There's a high washout rate, and mm -hmm. and the, the screening process just to get there is incredible. But yeah. Uh, if you make it your goal and everything you do in life is working towards that goal, you'll be successful. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's something that's uh, doable. I know that um, we have a friend that works for the FBI Training Academy, William Bethards. We're trying to get him to come on the show. For anyone that's interested in these kinds of uh, careers, I don't know if you know William Bethards. Uh, uh, I, I know him by reputation because you were talking about him when you were out here with me. Yeah, he's a he's a he was in the Marines. And he's a competitive shooter. I think he shoots for the Cabot Guns team. Um, and then he works for the FBI Training Academy. He has us and the whole family up there. So um, that's still a good thing. And there's lots of things out there. But like Mike said, you have to kind of be focused on that, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah you have to have a focus. Okay, someone wants to know uh, what you think about the whole Springfield Armory, the recent incident with Springfield Armory. You know, I, I wish I was better versed in it. Um, when that all uh, hit the news, I was actually in Las Vegas with Springfield Armory for their XDE rollout. And I'll say this, uh, I've known Robbie Latham for years. I had a chance to meet Dennis Reese up there at that gathering and his daughter, and, uh, and, and she's working there now also. Tremendous people, it's very hard for me to believe that they would throw the gun community under the bus um, to kind of save their own skins. Uh, I think the way it's being portrayed uh, in the, the various different outlets that you run into on Facebook is very unfair. Um, I think they were sold a bill of goods by the people that were working for them and that some of the decisions that they made on their behalf were um, certainly counterproductive. Yeah, I think, you know, that's one of the things that happens, right? You know, you have to be really careful when you're doing this and and be careful who you're taking advice from. And are those people really gun guys? And are they honest enough to say to you, okay, gun guys aren't going to go for this. You know, maybe don't do this thing. These things are always more complicated than they seem. I mean, I know I was one of those people out there that was outraged about it. Lots of people will never buy their stuff and always hold it against them. You know, fortunately, this thing is pretty much uh, like stopped dead in its tracks, you know, and, um, you know, the damage was done, you know, on all sides. So, you know, we'll see how this all plays out in the future and whether or not things like this happen. And, you know, I think we have to at some at some level allow people to make mistakes, own up to the mistakes and then give them an opportunity to see where they take it from there. Well, absolutely. And uh I think it was just within a day or two that uh, Dennis Reese filmed a very nice video about what actually happened. And um, look, this this man, and his family makes their living by selling guns to gun people. And the last thing they're going to do is is try to screw over those very same people who are their customers. Yeah, yeah. I think um, if they if they if they didn't take it seriously before, I think definitely now they're looking at everything very closely and thinking about what they're doing and completely hands-on, right? Yeah. Going yeah, they, they, yeah, they fired that that group of lobbyists who was working on their behalf, so. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I do want to wrap this up, but I know you're you're a movie guy, right? You're into movies? I like movies. Yeah. So, um, seen any good movies lately? 
my two favorite movies for 2016 were uh, Sicario and Hell or High Water. Hell or High Water. Yeah, now, Hell or High Water, I don't think I've seen yet. Sicario, when I saw that movie, I thought about you the whole way through. <laughs> I did too. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at Sicario, I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> you know, that's what I mean. And that's why I was asking you this question. And I wanted to know if you actually saw that movie and what you thought about it. Yeah, I, I thought it was a, a tremendous script and well acted. And um, uh, the, the main character, even though it's a woman, it just made me think about being put in a position, uh, in a situation, in a position where you didn't have all the cards on the table were not dealt. So, um, I mean, I was working for ATF on their behalf and risking my life and uh, diligently following their orders. Yet I didn't didn't really have all the, the knowledge necessary that maybe I would have needed to say, hey, I, I don't want to be involved in this anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's like games inside of games. Okay, so you know what? I'm, I'm definitely going to wrap this up now. We've been going for some time. Um, what? How can people get in touch with you? How can people see what you're doing? And like I said before, support you. Yeah, uh, add me as a friend on Facebook, Mike Betty, and uh, I'm in Arizona because there's a couple Mike Bettys. And then uh, if you want to see some more about the book, I have a Facebook page called Guns Across the Border. And uh, if anything topical comes up, I'll post it. And in between that, I'll post some old interviews with uh, people like Cheryl Atkinson or William Lajeunesse from Fox News. And uh, uh yeah, that's yeah. probably the best way. Yeah, definitely support Mike Daddy that way. Um, get the book if you can, you know, Operation Thank Wide you. Receiver. And you're writing articles and stuff like that. Check that out. Do you have any cool guns that you've got articles coming out with? Anything, any kind of guns you could throw up and share with us real Just quick? Just got a, a brand new one from uh, Car Arms. That's the new S9. 3.6 inch barrel and it's very much like the CW9, their economy, nine millimeter gun, except now they're putting the forward cocking serrations. It's uh, three dot white sights. The okay, rear just sight. hold it up a little. Can you just hold it up a little bit? Yeah, hold it up higher. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, the, okay, cool. Yeah, that's rear sight on this one is steel now, still a polymer front sight. The factory does sell uh, uh, tritium night sights so you can replace them. Uh, accessory rail there so you could put a light or laser combo on there. Um, it comes with two magazines instead of one magazine like the old CW9 uh, guns did. I've taken it out and shot it and at 15 yards I'm shooting five shot groups that are about three quarters of an inch. It's a, a neat little gun. It's uh, actually a little bit slimmer and trimmer than the Smith & Wesson Shield has a nice trigger on it. Uh, so I've been shooting this the past weekend and enjoying it. Yeah, have you ever shot the P9? I have, yeah. yes. Oh, okay, and and what do you think about uh, this compared to that? Not a lot of difference. I mean, if you were blindfolded and had one put in each hand, you would be hard pressed to find a difference. Um, the, the CW line and now the new S9 line uh, are their economy guns and they're, it's not that they're not aware of the competition and basically that's why we're having two magazines now shipped with each gun and uh, it's at a price that most people can afford. It's probably a realistic street price is going to be around 400 bucks on that. Yeah and there's definitely some people out there, I know a few that are um, that are you know car people, they like the car guns. So, and that's your entry level into getting into that. Uh, one other quick thing. If there was a movie of this whole thing, who would play you? Bobcat Goldthwait. <laughs> okay. Didn't see that one coming. <laughs> yeah. no, you know, uh, I don't, are you familiar with Paul Markle? Paul, yes. Paul, Paul Markle, the student of the gun. Yes, and student of the gun, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul's an old Marine and gun writer, and, and now he has his own video series and uh, uh, puts out content just about every day on Student of the Gun. But uh, he told me one time about Tim Abel, and I actually didn't know who Tim was until I did a little research and found out about his Special Forces background and, and uh, black belts and uh, martial arts and so forth. And 
usually always plays a military guy or a tough guy or something. And, uh, and, and he said, Tim would be, uh, excellent to play that character. So, uh, if, if they ever make a movie, I'll suggest Tim Abel. Oh, okay, cool. I'll take that. All right. So, um, let me, let me, um, wrap it up on my end. I want to thank everyone that's like watching this, asking questions and stuff like that. Uh, if you've got more questions, you can leave them here. Don't forget to share this with your friends and everything. Uh, also, if you really want to get those questions answered, you can also reach out to Mike Daddy on Facebook. Like he said, I'm sure, sure. he'd be happy to answer those questions. Um, 904 Outdoors wants me to remind you guys that he's going to be my special guest. I guess uh, Steve and Brian are going to be our special guests tomorrow here. I want to thank everyone that sponsors the Hank Strange situation. That is Rand CLP, Safety Harbor Firearms, Andrews Custom, and of course, Big Daddy Guns. Big Daddy Guns, we're here in the studio. And uh, I cannot go for one more time encouraging you guys to get Operation Wide Receiver. I kid you not. This will blow your mind. <laughs> You've got to read this book. It, it, this, w there's no way we could cover all the stuff that Mike has in this book. So read it, support him. He's a, he's a really good guy. And uh, I think that you, you won't regret reading the book. I want to thank everyone. Thank you especially, Mike, for, um, for coming on today and talking about this. I know it's not like the easiest thing in the world necessarily. No, not, not at all. I mean, it's, it's, it's nothing. I appreciate your support and, and keeping it out there in front of people. It's an old story, but um, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from it. No, we will not let it go away. We will do some stuff on this. And if you want to support us, and I want to thank our supporters on Patreon, lest I forget that, we are Patreon slash Hank Strange. So that's it. I'm out. Stay right there, Mike. But we are out of here. Peace. <laughs>